Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your presence, God, that you are still in this room with us. That worship was so amazing. It was so thick, God. Your presence was so heavy on us. Don't let us leave that place, God. Help us to stay right there with you in the cloud. Help us to follow you wherever you're taking us this morning. Don't let us leave unchanged today because I believe it's your will for us to become more like you today. I believe it's your will for us to learn and to go and execute a plan that you're going to give us. That's why it's Strategy Sunday. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your teaching, for your strategy. I thank you for the hearts that are open and the minds that are open to receive your message this morning. God, I ask that you would just bless us through this word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know what's really cool? Um, just then, what we did was we got to step into the presence of a holy creator. When, when we pray, that's what we do. And I feel like sometimes we kind of we kind of just take it for granted. Like I know um, if you're anything like me, you probably grew up in a house where you, you said grace over your food or, or you might do that now. But it kind of becomes a thing where you sit the food down and you're like, Lord, thank you for the food, amen. And then you just eat it, right? But I mean, it's so big. What we're doing in that moment is so huge. It's so monumental. We're stepping into the presence of God who is surrounded by hundreds of thousands of angels in this moment who are singing holy, holy, holy. That's their only job is just to sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's all they do all day long, every day, and they are in his presence. And it's incredible. And we got to step into his presence. This is the one who spoke and everything happened. We're only here because he, he uttered a word. That's why we're here. And we get to step into his presence. We were given the opportunity to come before him clean, righteous, through Jesus Christ. And that's what we get to do when we pray. So I don't know, uh, I don't entirely know, I'm not doing a sermon on prayer this morning. I don't know why I felt led to share that or to say that. But I think, I think it's so important for us to keep that in the front of our minds anytime we're coming into uh, a gathering anytime we're going to do ministry is just to know we are serving this very present this very right here God he's not this far off distant maybe I'll talk to him next week father but he's right here and we get to step in front of him so I think that's awesome um, I, I think but it does kind of go along with the message I'm going to tie it in everybody watch this um, we're talking about having a grateful heart today so we're talking about be, being glad and, 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 and just being grateful for the things that we have in our lives. And sometimes we walk around like we don't, we don't have anything good going on in our lives. And I know that's just not the case. You woke up this morning, and everybody, everybody do an exercise with me. We're going to draw a breath in. We're just going to breathe in together. Ready? One, oh, you guys are doing it already. Hang on. Hang on. Ready? One, two, three. And let it out. I heard one time somebody who, who did that exercise, they said, they said, you know, what if every time we breathed in, we just thank God? Like our exhale was just thanking God for the inhale that he allowed us to take just then. Imagine that. Every time you exhale, is just, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right? That's, and that's, that's kind of the concept that I want to get across today is just being grateful. Just coming into the Lord's presence with a grateful attitude, with a grateful heart, and not like you deserve something. Don't come into his presence as if you deserve anything, right? But with a grateful heart, just saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for everything that you've done, for everything that you're doing, everything that you're going to do. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to follow you. And if you don't go, I won't. Just like, just like the Israelites, when, when, they, when they came to the edge of the promised land, it gets me every time. They were so grateful for the presence of the Lord. They come to the edge of the promised land, and Joshua's standing there, and, and he looks up, and he goes, God, are you going? Because I'm not going to go if you don't. He said, it looks great. It looks awesome. You've made a lot of promises, and I believe you that it's incredible, but I'm not going without you. That's a grateful heart. That's what having a grateful attitude in the presence of the Lord looks like. And I think in a big way, our nation has been robbed of gratitude. Um, we, we've let the enemy kind of sneak in like a thief in the night and take our, take our gratitude away. Because we're, we're, we're a society, not just a generation. This isn't a generational thing. you know. And, and, and I see it in young people, but it's probably just because I spend a lot of time around young people. I'm sure you see it in older generations too, but that's, you know, just whoever you're hanging around with, you probably see this, especially in, in the United States and in, in our Western civilization. We see 
just just ungratefulness this this mentality of instant gratification instant satisfaction like if i don't know the answer to something i can google it i'm just going to just going to pray to the great google and i'll get my answer immediately and that's that's kind of where we're at as as a society and i'm not down in google i google all the time but i'm saying we we we've allowed that to creep into the church and into our faith and 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 poison who we are on the inside and kind of taken away our grateful heart and replaced it with a prideful heart. And I think there's three things that, that really happen um, that, that, that kind of take away from our gratitude that kind of make us to where we're not as grateful, where we don't uh, show as much gratitude to, to Jesus, where we're not like, thank you, Jesus, all the time, where, where we go through our day and it's like, well, that was just a normal day, an average day. And I want to ask a question really quick. Um, it, it was raining. Um, earlier this week it rained a little bit this week and i bet everybody noticed that it rained and i bet everybody had something to say about the fact that it was raining probably something like me i I drive uh uh for for work i have to drive and i I go and make deliveries so when i saw that it was raining i got up and i was like oh great it's raining i'm gonna have that kind of day today but the last time that it was just an average day you know sunshine was out it was it was decent weather it was a good day I didn't, I didn't look up and say, oh, this is awesome. Look at that sunshine out there. Look how green and dry the grass is. Thank you, Lord. I didn't do that. But I will complain when it's raining. Right? But I won't be overjoyed when it's a day like today. Look out, look out these windows right now. It looks awesome outside today. And I know there, there are some people who are sitting there like, well, I thank God when there's a nice day. That's awesome. I'm trying to get where you're at. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I, I think all of us need to be in that place where it's like every time there's a nice day outside, thank you, Jesus. And when it's raining outside, I'm going to bless your name anyway, Jesus. Instead of, ah, oh, it's raining again today. And, and, and I, think, I think that pretty much sums up our attitude toward a lot of things. Everybody can remember the last time something bad happened to them. Like, like we, the bad moments in our life stand out. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one right now when my parents are watching this later. Um, they're probably going to call me and, and get on to me. But they took me to uh, Disney when I was four years old. And the only thing I remember about going to Disney is how terrified I was of the person in the goofy costume. That's all I remember about Disney and the hotel. The hotel because uh, we were supposed to go to the pool and the pool was closed. So uh, those are the two things that I remember about Disney. I don't remember the fun that I had. You know, apparently I saw the picture of me with a giant ice cream cone, so I think I had fun. But I don't remember any of it. The negative is what's standing out in my head. You know, I think back and I, you know, I think as hard as I can. At four years old, you know, my memory's not, you know, that great where I can just look back and tell you everything I did while I was in Florida. But I can, like, in detail tell you the bad things that happened. I remember waking up, getting excited, waking my parents up, like, hey, we got to go downstairs and swim in the pool. We get down there, there's a sign, pool closed. And then I remember hiding behind my mom because the, the person with the goofy costume wanted to pick me up. And I was like, ain't happening. Um... And I was just hiding. I was, I was trying to get away from it. And those are the only two things that I remember about my trip to Disney in Florida. I've been told I need to go back, but um, I don't know. Y'all pray for me. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm having some issues. I'm, I'm a little scarred from that experience. Um, I want to tell you uh, something else, too, that, that really surprised me. Uh, not too long ago, my parents don't live in Columbia. They live about two hours away in Watertown. So anytime we go and visit, we usually end up staying the night with my parents when we go, me and my family. My wife's not here, so I keep gesturing over here. This is These are not my wife. Any of these gentlemen on this front row or that lady, none of them are my wife. I keep gesturing because this is where she always sits, and she's not here. So it's like, you know, you guys know how it is if you're married. Um, I think... I think it was about a month ago. We went to my parents' house. We stayed the night, and afterward, we were getting all of our stuff ready to go. And I went upstairs, and I started to make the bed that we had slept in. Um, it's my childhood room, so it's really great. Still got all my posters on the wall. Um, but I was, I was making this bed, and Brianna comes upstairs, and she says, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm just making the bed. We got to go. And she's like, yeah, but you've never done that before. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, Really? I've never made, I, I make our bed. And she's like, no, I'm talking about here. It's usually like when we got to go, I'm getting everything ready. And, and I make the bed and I get all this. And she's like, so is everything okay? What's going on? And I was like, I'm just making the bed. I, we got to go. And in that moment, I realized she was just extremely grateful that I was making the bed. That I was doing this one thing. She just looks at me and she's like, 
that's awesome. Thank you. And then she comes over and like gives me a hug and all this stuff. And I was like, hey, all right, I'm going to make the bed more often. This is great. I'm going to have to start doing this. What a novel idea. Maybe I'll make it once a week. That'd be great. I, I don't see the point in making a bed. I'm just going to uh, tell you right now, you're going to get in it again later on. So covers are going to get messed up again. Throwing it out there. <laughs> but in that moment, it, it kind of it kind of clicked with me um, and st- started me down this rabbit trail. I've been studying about having a grateful heart ever since that and just, and just about being grateful. And I've tried to adopt this idea of gratitude and just anytime somebody does something for you, anytime somebody goes out of their way and does something that they don't have to do, there, there should be this explosion that happens in your chest of just thanks and, and, and thanksgiving and, and telling them how much you appreciate it, right? And that's not how it is a lot of the time. Everybody who's got a steady do, uh, job knows that you are not always appreciated uh, in your workplace. You're not always appreciated for doing things that you don't have to do, but you choose to do them anyway. Anybody who's got kids knows it really well. Um, but but I think I think... That's something that we as the church, as the body of Christ, need to adopt in our culture. Because it's the culture of the world to be a consumer. Um, even, even in the church, even in the church, uh, you have the people that come in and they're like, okay, what can I get today from church? Instead of, okay, how can I serve today? Right? Uh, the first thing that I, I try and tell people anytime somebody you know, tells me they're looking for a church or they need to get back into church, I'm like, okay, well, find a church that you can really plug into. Find a church, not, not a church where, oh, you really like the worship or you know, even where you really like the word that's being you know, uh, brought. Now, don't get me wrong. If, if a church has a doctrine that doesn't uh, fall into what the scripture says, run the other way, absolutely. But go to a church that needs you. Don't go to a church that you like necessarily. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure if you start working in it, you're going to like it. But go to a church that needs you, that has a hole that you could fill, where it's like, God has blessed me with this specific skill set, and I can get involved in this, in this church. I can get involved in this community of believers, and I can be a part of this. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than doing ministry, than just using the, the God-given gifts. It says, it says the, gifts of the, the gifts of the Spirit are without repentance. You've got them, and God's not going to take them back. They're yours to keep. He gave them to you. They're without repentance. You can have them. But will you use them? I want to tell you guys about something. Again, my parents are going to, they're just, I'm going to give them a lot to talk to me about today when they call me later. Um, they bought me something for Christmas not too long ago called, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say already because we talked about it. Um, they bought me this thing. It's called the Wonder Bible. Has anybody seen the Wonder Bible advertised on TV? Two people. Cool. Awesome. So the Wonder Bible is an amazing idea, or it would have been in 1985. Uh, so, so the Wonder Bible is this little box, and it comes with a booklet full of codes, and if you punch in the right codes, it'll start reading you that verse of Scripture. But it's a code. It's not like you can't type in Genesis 1. It's got to be like 111111, right? So then if you want to go to the next one, it's 111112. So you type in a code for every verse of scripture that you want, and it gets really confusing. That's why I'm glad I got the, the little book. And I use it. I use the Wonder Bible. Like if I'm if my phone's on low battery or if I want to, you know, have Mason playing on my phone or something, I'll use the Wonder Bible to, to hear scripture. But I have an app on my phone that reads me the Bible in every language that exists and also in any translation that I want. Sometimes I turn on the Hawaiian Pigeon translation of the Bible just for just for some fun. If you if if you guys know what Hawaiian pidgin is, it's like the sailor talk. It's kind of a mutt of a whole bunch of different languages. And if you read the Bible that way, it is so much fun. Um, it's hilarious. So I use my phone for that, and I have this Wonder Bible. And it was a gift that was given to me by my parents, right? It's up to me whether or not I use it. And God did the same thing when you were born. He said, before I put you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Not only... I knew you as in I know this spirit form floating around and I'm going to put it inside of a womb. I know everything that you're ever going to do. I know every mistake that you're ever going to make. I know every good choice that you're ever going to make. And I am going to give you these gifts because I know exactly what purpose I have on your life. And he will never take them back. He said they are yours. Now there's people who don't use their gifts at all and then there's people who misuse their gifts too, I believe. But if you 
are going into a body of believers, the best thing that you can do is go up to a pastor or a member, a member of leadership in that church and just say, hey, this is, this is what I'm working with. Where, where do I fit in? Where, where can I serve? That's what Jesus did. Look at Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, left his home in heaven, came in the form of a man, in, in this, in this weak, fleshly vessel, and just pretty much walked around saying, how can I help? That's what Jesus did. Like his whole ministry, he would walk up to, to beggars in the streets and, and, and lame people, and he would say, how can I help you? What can I do for you? What do you need from me? And he'd heal them, and he'd serve them. And then he got down on his hands and knees, and he washed his disciples' dirty feet. They'd spent a lot of time in the Gospels talking about how they never had a place to, to sleep or to lay their heads, so I bet they had some pretty stinky feet. And the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, got down and washed their feet for them. And every time people were hanging out with Jesus in a big crowd, they were eating. So it's like Jesus always provided a meal for people. And I know that's something that we can all get on board with, right? But that's what Jesus did. And if the whole point of this Christianity thing is to be more like Jesus, then I think a big part of that is just finding an area where we can serve. That, that's that's going to break the consumer mentality in the church. I'm not just talking about the consumer mentality in America. Yeah, you know, the world the world is, is its own thing. But I'm talking about in the church, the body of believers, people coming together under the umbrella term Christian. We are coming together and, and so many people come into uh, churches and just think, what can I get out of it today? You know? And, and, and it's... It's a, such a unique thing, I think, um, for the United States. Because if you ask somebody, <clears throat> sorry, you ask somebody who's in another country, in a country especially where there's persecution for Christians, I'm talking real persecution, not like I might walk outside and somebody might say, hey, I don't believe in God, uh, or, or say, hey, you're stupid for being a Christian. You know, not that kind of persecution, but the kind of persecution where if you talk about God, you go into jail or you're getting killed. There, there are countries like that, and, and people don't g gather together because they're like, okay, what can I get out of this? What can, what can I do here? Now, they, they gather together in those countries, and they are, they're overjoyed with it. And there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no other alternative option like we have in the United States where it's like, <clears throat> where it's like I, I don't like the worship band at this church, so I'm going to go down the road to the other church. But I don't like the way that that guy talks, so I'm going to go into their worship service. Uh, and after worship's over, I'm going to jet over to this church and listen to the message over there. They don't have that opportunity in, in these other places. And... and I'm not saying that having a whole lot of churches is a bad thing because I think it's a really good thing. I think every church in the community serves a purpose, absolutely. But what I'm saying is there's a problem with our minds where we have allowed our minds to become corroded and corrupted by the, the ways of the world, right? And, and we have fallen into the consumer uh, mentality of the United States uh, and of the world, really, you know, in, in large. I, I heard somebody... Uh, kind of give an illustration to this idea not long ago where it said, okay, here's God, right? And right there is the church. So we're not, we're not like far away from God and at, at the church's conception. We're so close. Jesus had been spending time. It was Peter, and Paul, and all these big names, like the celebrity apostles, you know, leading the church and the world. Right, And the world has kept going further away, but it's not like the church has stayed, right? It's like the church is still, there's a, still a big gap between the church and the world, and I believe that. But it's like the church has been moving steadily as well. So if they are two fixed points, they're both moving, and God's staying in the same place. He's unchanging. He doesn't go anywhere. But our standards have gotten so low as a society of believers, we, we can't allow that to happen anymore. We can't allow it to go any further than it's gone. We have to do some serious repair, and it starts in here. Don't, don't conform to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to start right here in ourselves. We got we to, gotta, and, and it hurts. I'm going to tell you what, I turned the mirror on myself after trying to adopt this idea, and it was, it was painful. It's like, ouch. I, I was like, you know, that whole expression, baptized in fire, I feel it. I feel the fire. I'm having to cut things out. I'm having, I'm having to analyze my own life because if I'm out there living like a hypocrite, then nobody's going to listen to the teaching that God put inside me anyway. 
So this message that I'm giving is not just, you know, some guy coming up here and calling people out. This is, this is like God really spoke this into my life. He's like, hey, check this out. And I was like, whoa, I'm sorry. <laughs> God was saying to me, we have to break the consumer mentality that we have. We have to renew our minds through Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, we have to be transformed so that we look more like him and look less like the world out there. Because if the church looks just like the world, then why would anybody come to church? If the church looks just like the world, then why would anybody get out of bed? This is a teenager, by the way, who said he, he got out of bed this morning. So everybody just know that. Teenager sacrifice and sleep. That's awesome. That is so cool. He And he talked about it. I didn't talk about it. He did. Um, why would anybody get out of bed and come to a church service in the morning if we act just like the world does? And I'm not talking about just when we're here. I'm talking about outside, too. You don't just have to be good here. I think a lot of people have that conception. Has anybody seen the movie? We showed it not long ago. Uh, my bad. Has anybody seen the movie The Resurrection of Gavin Stone, by chance? Yeah, Chris, Chris showed it here at the church. Hilarious, uh, heartfelt, dramatic. Oh, it's awesome. It's got a movie. The guy, the main character in that movie, I'm not going to spoil anything, but he comes to church and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't act like this outside of church, but while he's at church, he's walking around shaking everybody's hands. He's like, oh yeah, blessings, blessings, blessings to you, blessings. Yes, yes, Lord's blessings on you, praying with you, you know, and, and I'm not saying don't say those things. I know a lot of people who say those things. What I am saying is if you're just acting like that here, you've missed it. If you're just acting like that while you're in this safe little place full of people who believe what you believe, you've missed it. Jesus would walk through big gatherings of Pharisees and act the same way that he acted when he was one-on-one -on -one with the disciples. The Pharisees, who knew everything about the Bible, they could tell you not only, not only the Scripture, but they could tell you what page it was on in the Torah, right? They could, they could quote anything. They knew it, right? They had it committed to memory. It's like they were walking around just spouting off Scripture all day long. And so Jesus... Who, who is perceived by the Pharisees as this false teacher, walks in front of them and he's like, you know, do you think in, in the back of Jesus' head, I know I have these moments and I know everybody does, do you think Jesus thought in the back of his head, I need to impress these people, they know everything? Or did he just walk in front of them and say, I'm just going to be Jesus. I'm just going to be Jesus today. I'll be Jesus tomorrow. Why don't you go out and be Jesus today? I, I heard somebody, who was it? Was it David Ransom maybe? He's around here somewhere. There he is. Uh, I, think, I think it was him who said, when we're walking out there, you know, you might not be able to hand one of these over to somebody and get them to read it, but they're going to see you, and you may be the only Bible that they ever read. Or the first Bible that they read. Right? That's a reason why people have such a, a, a low impression of the church. Like, like, like not a good impression of church going is because we've become too much like the rest of the world in a big part. I'm talking about the church as a whole, not this church. I'm not, I'm not just coming against us. I think this is a, an awesome body of believers. That's why I'm a part of it. That's why I wanted to serve in it. It's because Jesus has put the calling into everyone, and he's put a skill set into everyone. And he said, when you go into a place of people who are doing my work, get involved. All right? Don't just come in. And, and eat the food and leave, you know? Anybody got relatives like that? I'm thinking of one relative right now. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to say his name. Uh, I'm thinking of one. His, his like, like, I can pretty much guess about the time. Well, I hate to eat and run. He says that every time he's over at the house. Well, if you hate it so much, why do you do it so often? <laughs> Don't be just that consumer that comes in to grab a couple of... Uh, a, couple of donuts off the table and then leave. Be that person that comes in and says, okay, how can I help? You need me to wash the dishes after you're done? You want me to help you cook next time? What can I do to further this? If we adopt that mentality, guess what? We're going to need a new building. I think every church in Columbia would need a new building if we would just operate in that mindset. How can I help? What can I do? Where do you need me? That's going to change the way, I'm serious, it'll change the way that you live your life. I think the second thing um, that really pulls us away from the spirit of gratitude, and this is probably the most impactful thing and, and maybe even the most evident thing that you can see in other people, um, you don't see it a lot in yourself when, when you're struggling with it, is pride. 
pride. Ah, uh, it's it's almost like that's become a curse word. It's like I'm I'm like, oh, should I even say that? That's so nasty. Such a bad word. Pride, being proud of yourself. Look at me, look what I did, look what I accomplished. And on the other side of that pride coin is how dare they talk to me like that? Who do they think they are? They want me to do that? Do they know who I am? It pulls you away from a spirit of gratitude where you're like, wow, I have the opportunity to help. You know why Satan isn't in heaven anymore? Not because of God's will. God didn't create this rebellious creature. God created a creature with free will. He created an angel who had free will, just like we all have free will. And Satan made the decision not to live in the will of God anymore because he got proud of himself. He heard people saying, wow, you, you just the most beautiful of all the angels. You have such a great singing voice when you worship God. Man, you're God's right-hand man. You are incredible. And he started to think, you know what? I am pretty darn incredible. I, I mean, I'm just saying stuff that I've, I've let creep into my head before. And you know what? I am pretty good. I used to do martial arts uh, for a living, so there's that. No, I'm kidding. I, I used to... I used to do martial arts for a living. It's what I did. I taught martial arts. Uh, before that, when I was in high school, I was a martial arts competitor. I competed you know, at some pretty high levels. I went to a national championship when I was 17. Uh, incredible journey. I love martial arts. I loved what it did for me. But I got to a place of pride in my martial arts journey. I think I've told uh, my youth this story probably a million times. So you guys just uh, take a, na- a five-second nap and then wake up and rejoin us. Um, I, I went to the national competition and... It came really easy to me. Martial arts came really easy to me. You know, I definitely had to work at it at first, but once I got the hang of it and started doing it, it was like I could catch on to new things pretty fast. And I ended up getting second place in my weight division at the national competition when I was 17 years old. So the next year, I was like, I'm going for first place this year. And my first match of the year was an out-of-state tournament that I had never been to, never seen the competition pool out there. And I decided, you know what? I'm a national champion. I can go back down to training one day a week. I don't have to do anything special to prepare for this. I've, you know, I've been here before. I've done tons of little uh, state tournaments before. I didn't even hear the person say go um, when when we had this match and I woke up on the ground. Uh, I got knocked out. It's the only time in my life, first time and only time I'd ever been knocked out in my life. And I was just laying on the floor, and I look up at the guy that kicked me, and he was helping me up. I was like, what happened? You know, I was looking at him. I was like, what would you do? And uh, he's like, I, I, kick, I kicked you. That's what he said. He said, I, I kicked you. I kicked you pretty hard. Um, I don't even remember the lady saying go. It's on video, though. She did say go, so it wasn't her fault. Um, I must have slipped or something. Um, but it, it, it humbled me. It brought me to a place of being humble. I, I, in that point of my life, you know, as a, as a young adult, teenager, 18 years old, I let pride creep into my life, and, and I got puffed up, and I was like, I'm Adam Johnson, Taekwondo legend. They won't even remember who Bruce Lee was. Like, that's, that's how I felt about myself. I really did it. 18 years old, going into this competition, best thing that could have ever happened to me, as far as martial arts goes, was me getting knocked out. Best thing that could have ever happen to me. It humbled me. It brought me down to know I'm just a human. I'm just somebody else who's going through this, and if I don't work at it, if I don't keep, keep working, if I don't keep doing these things... If I, don't, if I don't go to the basic level, if I, don't, if I don't keep reviewing and reviewing and reviewing, I can get knocked out. I can be beat. Yes, even me. It's a surprise to me too. That's how, that's how it is. Yeah, there you go. That's how it is with, with our faith too. Though. That's how it is with our relationship with Jesus Christ. How? Let me ask just a few questions. I want you to self-evaluate. I had to do this yesterday. While I was going over my notes, I had to reevaluate because I did this like a month ago, like I said. But I had to, I had to look internally and evaluate. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do in this moment is just internally evaluate. Nobody has to raise their hands or anything um, unless you're just super convicted. And you're like, me, preacher, you're talking about me. Um, look internally and ask yourself this question. How, lo- how, how often do you just get alone in the presence of the Lord? How often do you take time just to talk to God? Uh, you know, I talked earlier about how awesome it is that we can get in his presence, but how often do you do it? Um, has it just become another thing? And you're like, yeah, if I have time, I'll get to it. Um, 
I'll tell you right now, if, if we treated our relationships that way, like with our spouses, with our significant other, with our children, with our parents, if we treated our relationships like that, where it's like, I'll just talk to them whenever I have time, we wouldn't have any relationships. They would wither up and die. I had to really think about it. I was like, do I, do I actually pay God attention? I know that happens in marriages sometimes where somebody feels like they're not getting attention from their spouse or they, they don't feel like they're getting the right kind of attention or the, the individual time. Uh, everybody wants that. Everybody wants to feel important. And we are so willing, at least, you know, it, at least at first, like when it's, when it's the honeymoon phase or whatever in a, in a relationship, you want to give that person all of your time. You want to go buy flowers. You want to take them out to dinner. You're like, what are you doing later? You stay on the phone with them for six hours not saying anything. Right? But do you do that in the presence of the Lord? Do you just bask in his presence? Do you just start talking to him and it's just like, man, I lost track of time. I was late for work talking to Jesus. I've, I've been late to work before because I've been sitting there talking to my wife or, or just looking at my baby. I have. I've, I've like, oh, man, I got to go. And, and I, think, I think if we think about God in that same way, it's going to open our eyes to like, Wow. I can get back to this. Baby. See, she knows what I'm talking about right back there. Absolutely. Amen. I think, I think it's the most fundamental piece of Christianity, too, is talking to God through Jesus. It is. It's like one of the first things that Jesus taught us to do was how to pray. Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He taught them how to pray because they were genuinely like, how, how do we talk to God? How do we do that? Teach us. Teach us how to talk to God. And he did. So what do we do with it now that we know? We know as a generation, we have like we got the instruction manual. What do we do with it? Do we spend that time with, with God? And then the next step, do we spend time serving and using our gifts to glorify him? I want to tell you one thing. It's, it's two different things, okay? And, and, and all the parents in the room will really jive with this and know what I'm talking about. I see my son... And I love him immediately when I see him. It fills me up. I love Mason. And I love my daughter. I love Galilee so much. When I look at him, I just I feel that love and that connection. But sometimes I'm not too happy with, with either one of them. You know, like when Galilee wakes me up at 2 a.m., I don't have to be happy with her to love her. When Mason does something at school, like throw a rock at a car, I don't have to be happy with him to love him. Really happened. Yeah, I had to deal with that. <laughs> but... I, when God looked down at Jesus, when he came up out of the water, he didn't just say, this is my son who I love. He did say that, but that's not all he said. With whom I am pleased. Right? With whom I am pleased. So God's looking down on you right now. He's looking down at you. Even, even his sons and daughters that haven't found their way home yet. Even the wayward sons and daughters, he's looking down and saying, I love you. But is he saying, I'm pleased with you? Is he looking at you and saying, that's my son Chris. With him, I am well pleased. Or is he saying, that's my boy Chris. He's okay, I guess. I'm serious. Like, if, you start, if you start thinking about that, like God looking down at Jesus saying, I'm pleased with him, makes you like, well, I, I want God to be pleased with me. I want to throw this pride out of my life. I want to, get, I want to tear that root that it's trying to take in my heart. I want to tear it out. I want to throw it away, and I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to be that prideful, arrogant person who comes into a situation thinking, what's in it for me? I don't want to be the person who gets offended at everything someone says, at, at, at anything that I'm asked to do, like, like getting a phone call and saying, hey, I need some help moving. Can, I, can, can you come and help me move? Who do you think I am? I'm the youth pastor of New Life Church. I don't help people move. I don't ever want to be that person. You guys know people like that. I'm sure you do. You know why? Because America's full of them. For real. Like there are people who think that they are too good to do certain things when Jesus, who was the goodest good, got down and washed people's feet. I keep going back to that scene in my head because it's just so dramatic. You know, it's like, it's like anybody else, like everything that goes on in your head, it's like an action movie because that's what happens up here. And, and sometimes it's hard to deal with. But when I read the Bible, when I think about the Bible stories, it's like an action movie going on in my head. And in that moment, it's like the dramatic music's playing and Jesus wraps a towel around his waist and gets down and washes their feet. And it's, it's like the most incredible thing in the world. And the music's just got this crescendo that's building up. And then when he washes their feet, everybody's crying and all this stuff. 
it's it's that that is exactly where we need to get to that place of service keeping ourselves humble not allowing pride to to well up in us and saying you're too good for that responsibility not allowing pride to get in there and saying you you don't have to do that let somebody else do that that's that's beneath you cuz cuz pride is is not just it's not just negative it's not just bad it is a killer Satan, Lucifer, the angel, was in heaven with God, in God's presence, and allowed pride to sneak in. And he's not in heaven anymore. He's not in that host singing around the Father. Instead, he's causing all kinds of havoc around us. He got expelled from the presence of the Lord because of his pride. And and I don't want this to be one of those you know, uh, turn or burn kind of sermons this morning. But I do want to stress to you that pride in your life will separate you from the love of God. Not because He doesn't love you anymore, but because you think you're beyond it. You think you're too smart for it. That's the whole thing about God and science. People have gotten to a place where they're like, we're too smart to believe in that God stuff anymore. That's, that's the whole issue. When God created science, People have gotten to this place of, of thinking so prideful. Like, we have discovered. We have done this. We've made these discoveries. Scientists do this. Yada, yada, yada. We're too smart for God. It doesn't make any sense. And it's just from, from a pride, from, from this root of pride that grew into this tree and just destroyed it, separated you. That tree will come right in between you and the love of God in your life. You won't, you won't feel it anymore. But it's not because you can't step into it. It's because here's the love of God showering down on you and you've just kind of done this. I'm too good for it. And I think, I think lastly, I think the third thing, and this is the biggest thing, this is the one that's so huge, so monumental, the last thing that separates us and, and causes us to, um, to approach the world in such a consumer way and not to have this spirit, this, this idea of gratefulness, this, this heart that's just so overjoyed for everything that we have, is we've we've just kind of forgotten who we are. Um, I know that that one, I, and that's why I use the consumer mentality and pride first, is because they both feed into this this thing where we've forgotten the people that that that, that we're actually supposed to be. Um, in Proverbs sixteen, it says uh, it says that pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before failure people who are proud and you think there's a lot of successful proud people don't get me wrong um, but there's there's a day coming where where all of that's gonna mean nothing at all and there's something that's been so much more important their entire lives and they've just missed it um, and it's because they've forgotten who the Lord said that they were think about this let's let's let's, let's think back to like and I'm not gonna well, I might. Don't, don't tempt me. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis 1, and we're just going to work our way through, okay? So, <laughs> it, it's going to be good. You're going to like it. So, in Genesis, the very beginning, when, when God's creating all of the trees, all of the animals, and the waters, and separating the day and the night, and he's doing all this stuff, I wonder if the angels were up there thinking, this is awesome. What's it for? Why are you doing it? And then God's like, okay, day six. I've been, I've been working for five days. Here it is. Here's the big moment. And he reaches down and he molds this figure out of clay. And the angels are gathered around and they're like, whoa, that looks just like you. Because it says we're made in his image. And he breathes into it. And they're like, he's never done that before. This is big. And Adam, the first man, not me. Adam, the first man, starts walking around, talking. And God was like, I made all that for him. It's all for him. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to even do something else. It's not good for him to be alone. And he takes a rib and he makes Eve. And he created them, male and female. And he said, it, it was all for you. Here you go. And he turned over the earth to them. And he said, go be fruitful, multiply. He gave them jobs and responsibilities. He said, you know, name the animals. Enjoy. You know, this is... 
This is where we can be in, in communion together. This is where I can come down and we can, we can talk. I can walk in the garden with you. In God's presence every day. Every day. Adam and Eve just walking with Jesus. Picking an apple off a tree and just eating. Incredible. And that's who we are. And we've forgotten that. We've forgotten the garden. You know, in the Lord's Prayer when it says, Your will be done here, just like in heaven. Where in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching them to pray. He's like, you know, pray for God's will to be done on earth just like it is in heaven. That means we can experience heaven here. I never got taught that in, in Sunday school. No, for real, like that, that, that was something that, that blew my mind. I'm so happy that that, that, that revelation made itself evident to me in my life. It said, you can experience heaven and the presence of the Lord right where you are. Right now. You don't have to wait. It's not like, yeah, I'm saved now. i just waiting to go to heaven. That's, that's not at all what Jesus came and died for. He, he came and died so we could experience heaven every day for the rest of our lives and on into eternity. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's something I can't even wrap my head around that, that you know, when I'm worshiping, when, when the band's up here and when we're playing and when we're worshiping and when our hands are lifted, we just feel the presence of the Lord. It's like, that's heaven. That's what it's like. He's here. We can, we can do that every day. And then my mind kind of flips and I think about the world out there that's not in here this morning and who's never experienced that. It's no wonder there's a lot of unhappy people. It's no wonder there's a lot of people who are, who are going around trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. And, 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 and there's depression, there's sickness, there's weakness. There's no wonder if they're not doing that. So, so it's one thing, it's one thing when, when we have a pride issue. It's one thing when we have a consumer mentality. But it's an entirely different thing if we don't even know who we are. Jesus came and showed us who we are. Right, because we we had forgotten back then too, you know, from creation to Jesus, they'd forgotten who they were. So Jesus came and modeled it and showed them, "This is who you are. This is what you do." And we've forgotten it again. Here we are, two thousand years later, and we've allowed ourselves to forget again who we are. Um, we are the body of Jesus Christ Himself. We are the same creation that God said, "It's yours." And He was talking about the earth. He said, "All of it's for you." We are that same creation. You know what that means? Not only is it is it pretty awesome that, you know, this is the greatest gift anybody's ever given, you know. But it means we have authority here. We can operate in, in authority here on this earth, in this time, in this moment. And I don't know, I don't know what, what that makes you think of operating in authority. But there's a story in John. Everybody, uh, if you have your Bible, go to John 9. This is the perfect illustration uh, for this point. And I just want to read this story, starting in John 9, 1. <clears throat> it says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, or, or who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not this man or his parents. But he was made blind so that the might of God could be displayed through him. We must work, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And I want to stop right there. Jesus is walking and, and these his disciples are with him and they see this blind beggar and they're like, Well, why is he blind? Has anybody ever thought that before? Why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why are people born with handicaps? Blindness, lameness, mental issues. Why? Why does that happen? And we, we look at it, and, and a lot of times we have pity, and we have sorrow, and we're filled with confusion about it. But if we would look at them as an opportunity instead of as an obstacle, if we would look at their issues as opportunities instead of as obstacles, and we would just lay hands on them and in faith 
allow the work of God to be presented through their lives, there would be no sickness. There would be no weakness. There would be no none of this from birth. Because the story goes on and Jesus goes and, and spits in mud and he picks it up and he puts it on this guy's eyes and everybody's standing around like, ah, and this guy goes and washes his face and he comes back and he can see. And Jesus is like, look, that, that seemed pretty foolish, didn't it? Spitting in some mud and putting it on his face. Well, I'm going to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Those who would claim to be wise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confound them with foolishness. And it's going to work. So, so crazy how, how Jesus orchestrated every, every little move that he made. God had orchestrated it so it would just be so impactful. This, this story about this blind beggar who was healed. He was blind from birth when he was born. He had never seen. And then he comes back and he can see. And Jesus said, it's not because of sin. It's so the power of God could be shown through his life. And that's everybody. That's, that's every time you look at somebody, and, and I hope this inspires a boldness in you. You look at somebody and you see somebody struggling with something like a sickness or an illness or like a backache or, or you know, their, legs, their legs hurt or something like that. Just, all right, well, let's, let's take care of it. It's an opportunity for Jesus to work in your life right now. What I love is that Jesus forgave sins, you know, a lot of the time before he would do the healing. So your sins are forgiven, you know. And, and never do you see these people that Jesus says that to, they're like, well, that's great, but what about the healing? You know, they, they never do that because they're not consumers. They're like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Rabbi. And he's like, and, and somebody said to Jesus one time, he said, how can you forgive sins? He says, it is, is it easier for me to forgive a sin or for me to say, hey, you, get up, walk? And then the lame man stands up and walks. He says, it's, it's the same. Forgiveness of sin is just as easy as healing. And, and here's, here's the last thing that I want to say about who you are in Jesus Later on in John, in the same book, in John 14, uh, it's really cool. In John 14, 12, this inspired me the other day. John 14, 12, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus just told us that we're going to perform greater things than him. Are we doing that? Like, are we going out and performing, or even like walking side by side with, with in line with what Jesus did? Because he just said we will do the things, the works that he did, and greater works. That's who the church is. That's who God told me to remind you who you are today. You are someone who can do the things that Jesus did, but not just that, but greater works. That's insane to say. And there are probably a lot of religious people who I said, hey, I can do greater things than Jesus. They would hit me. Like, no joke. Like, it would be, I would be thrown out of there for saying that. But that's what Jesus himself said to you, is you're going you're gonna to do, like the church, you, you're going to do greater works. Because I'm going to the Father. And if you ask it in my name, I'll do it. Try it. That's who you are. So just know that by renewing your mind and coming into union with Jesus and being transformed into the original creation that we were intended to be, we can see miracles explode in this community. I believe it. We believe it. We, we believe it together. And I want that for you, for this community, for, for Columbia, for the world. I want to see it happen. And so does God. Because he sent me here today to remind you, to remind us, to remind me who we are. All because of Jesus. From the beginning of time, he had a purpose for us, and he still has a purpose today. Can everybody stand up while we pray? God, you are so good. You are holy, Lord. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for, for today, for the wonderful weather that you've blessed us with, for the opportunity you've given us just to come in and just to read about you, just to hear about you. Thank you for reminding us who we are. Help us to use it, God. This week as we go out, help us to use the abilities that you've given us. Help us to use the gifts that you've blessed us with, just the gift of life itself, the fact that we draw breath and we walk around. God, help us to use just that to impact people. Just the fact that we can speak to somebody about who you are. Just the fact that we can hug somebody and tell them that there's a God in heaven who loves them and wants to have a relationship with them. 
Lord, I ask that you empower each of us and give us confidence to go out and do that. Humble us, God. Break the consumer mentality on our lives and remind us who we are every day. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.